The last video we did on making a chair scrape, we didn't have time to demonstrate the process of doing wire inlay. So in today's video, we're going to demonstrate wire inlay techniques uh, showing how to inlay wire into wood and some of the tools that are used during the process. I've already inlaid the chair scrape offline and we'll, go, we'll review it and look at the process that we went through. When we speak of wire inlay in wood, there's three steps in the process. The, the first step that we'll discuss and, and show some examples of is how to transfer the pattern onto the wood. The second is what I refer to as stabbing in. It's where we actually use the tools to, to stab and open up the wood to a proper depth and opening to receive the, the ribbon wire. The last step is trimming off the surplus wire that's left above the wood level and, and bringing it back to a flush level so that the wire inlay is flush with the wood. The, uh, we're, after we cover each one of these steps, we'll actually do a, a demonstration showing the, the process from start to finish. and. Uh, We'll experiment with, uh, we'll, we'll do today's uh, wire inlay with a piece of, piece of maple. But the two woods most commonly used in, in wire in, inlay in guns and knives is uh, walnut and maple. Now, I'll be honest with you, the, if it's the first time I had ever wire inlaid hickory on that scrape, uh, but it was a rather difficult wood to uh, to wire inlay. So I encourage you, if you're gonna try and learn the process and do some experimenting, try several different types of wood to see which one, you know, they, woods are like metals. They're not all, all alike, and some of them are gonna have different characteristics. I guess the, the thing that I can emphasize more than anything in this video, the, the, the sharper, the crisper you make your tools for stabbing and breaking the wood, uh, it's going to make the process a lot easier. If, if you have a properly sharpened tool with an extreme sharp edge on it, you should be able to take your piece of wood and stab in to, to say a depth of 40 or 50 thousandths and, and stab and open up uh, a section of the wood and you, you might try this sometimes. We'll try to, if I can remember, we'll do it in the, in the video. But if you make two stab marks side by side, you know, separate them a little, and then take and then wet one and seal it, you should be able to come back after the, the, the water and, and the wood is no longer wet, and that grain should close back up, and you should not even be able to see where it was stabbed in right next to the one that you didn't wet. This is a method of, of sealing in and locking the wire in the wood. We do not use any glues or burn ends or anything like that. It's strictly stab it, put it in, and wet it, and you know, then flush it down, and it's locked in if it was done properly. Okay, what we have here are some examples of the wire itself, the ribbon wire that we'll be inlaying. This is uh, fine silver came from Rio Grande. The thickness of the wire is about 15 thousandths thick and 100 thousandths tall. Here's a, a roll or a small sample that came from a, a gun uh, supply house. They use it for inlaying them into long rifles. It's again, it's 15 thousandths thick but it's not quite as wide, it's only 50 thousandths wide. The, the first, the fine silver that we looked at, here's a section that I ran through the mill and compressed it. It is now 10 thousandths thick and we picked up about 10 thousandths on the width from rolling it through the mill. So you can, you can take these, uh, these ribbon strips and going through a roll mill or hammering them out on an anvil, you can size them to whatever thickness you want. I would suggest, if you've never done the process before, start with some wire that's 
10 to 12,000 sick and uh, about well 100,000 wide and we'll go into how to trim the wire down to the size that you want uh, okay as, as we mentioned earlier in the process there, there's three pieces of it first of all is transferring your artwork to the wood now here's some printouts that I did these are some scroll designs that came off the internet they were they were printed to use for transferring for doing engraving on metal but there's some good geometry here for picking up what I refer to as the backbones or the major lines. This is a little, it could be done, but it's a little busy for, for a beginner to do this level of wire inlay. The, uh, here's, here's another uh, printout from the internet. It's a modern, modernistic drawing of, of some ladies in, in different poses. I actually use one of these and we'll show you the sample of the wire inlay that's done, that was done from this artwork. Okay, here's a, a close-up shot of the, one of the ladies that was on that last print I showed where we inlaid it into a piece of maple. We just did this in a class I, I had on wire inlay. Uh, after doing so many C scrolls and S scrolls, you, you get tired of doing scrolls, so I just want to do, do something a little different. The chair scrape that we made in the last video, here's the wire inlay that I put in yesterday on it. I think this is about 12 thousandths uh, fine silver that I inlaid into this hickory shave. It's not as dramatic in the white. Once we apply a stain to the wood, you'll have a little, little better looking product. Uh, here's a Kentucky rifle. It was a reject rifle stock that I used to practice some wire inlay for the miniature Kentuckys. And you see, I, I stained the area around the wire. If we get a shot of this, I hope it shows up, but in this area right around here, get it in the camera. This area right around here, there's some wire inlay that was done with ribbon wire that was four thousandths thick. This is ebony, gamoon ebony, and I was just curious whether or not a hard, brittle wood like ebony would be able to stab in and receive the wire. It did, but it's not as nearly as user friendly as say maple or walnut. The rest of the inlay in this example, the wider lines, the way I did that is using the CNC mill and a small milling cutter. I cut the pattern in and then filled it with dental amalgam. Uh, silver based amalgam similar to what well same stuff that they used in filling your teeth when in the old days I don't think they use the amalgam anymore here's a brochure from uh, Kentucky uh, I'm sorry the National Mud Muzzle Load and Rifle Association uh, on one of their brochures this was a contemporary rifle that was you know done in the last 10 or 15 years I imagine but the old timers and, and a lot of the early uh, long rifles were embellished with the wire inlay particularly during the period of time we refer to as the golden era where the rifle builders after the Revolutionary War were competing and trying to get in get the business Once we've, once we've stabbed the wood and inserted the wire and you wet it down, locked it in, and you're ready to flush up the wood, these are the two tools that I use. This is a right angle Dremel tool. I, I'm not sure if they still make this anymore, but uh, it's, a, it's a cordless Dremel tool. This is my 
electric motor hand to Dremel shovel companies make them. It's just a high speed uh, hand to lot lighter, lot, it's a lot more comfortable than a, a heavier Dremel tool and uh, I use it probably more than I do the Dremel. Now, when, when sharpening the cutters and removing the, the wire inlay, I've designed, I didn't design them, there's some custom uh, tools that I made. I'd like to take you through and show you just a few of them. In, in the jewelry industry, there's a couple of uh, polishing tools here that the jewelers use for polishing and detailing small filigree work. These uh, are referred to as floppy discs. Uh, well, that's the way Rio Grande describes them in, the, in their catalog. But they're a silicon rubber flexible pad that's impregnated with, with different grits of silicon carbide. The brown one here is a little coarser as I remember uh, than, the, than the blue one. They're very, uh, they're very forgiving uh, and will put a, a super high polish on the metal. The, the way you use them in the tool, you can use them on the edge of the tool, but the way I use them for polishing flat surfaces of metal is I use them in a vertical position like such, the tool would be pointed like this. And you have that, f that flexible edge out there that gives you some really fine control and you can cover a wider surface. Now, in sharpening the tools, once you get it sharpened and polished and, and feel like it's it's ready to go it's a cutting tool and no matter how hard you've polished it and, and worked on the edge you can take this tool in the in the dremel tool or, or the motor tool and you go in here and you walk it across the edge keeping it flat and going off the end of the tool will give you a really highly polished sharp edge. That's the final, if you will, polishing or stropping operation I do when sharpening the tools. What I do, and, and had very good success with it, I'll take these tools, again referred to as floppy disks, and using a piece of Velcro, I will punch out sections of Velcro and I will usually put the, I'm going to call it the, I don't know if it's male or female, but it's the, it's the hard part that receives the, the felt or the soft uh, padding from the other side of the Velcro. And you can also buy sandpaper and punch out your own sanding disc that has the cloth on it. So if you've got your section of Velcro on the disc, these when you buy the Velcro in the in the two sections, okay. If I peel the adhesive off of the Velcro and apply it to this silicon flexible disc that's referred to as a, a floppy disc, now I've got a Velcro face on this guy. So I can apply, in this case, a piece of sandpaper that's got the cotton on it, it adheres to the Velcro. Now I've got me a small sanding disc. I've also applied Scotch-Brite. You punch you out a piece of Scotch-Brite pad and you can apply them to this floppy disc. The, the Scotch-Brite comes in handy for an intermediate after a, a sanding it goes in and it's a finer sanding. I discovered the other day looking through a drawer I saw these a group of these round hard felt pads. They have a self-adhesive stick sticky on the back. These are used come from Home Depot I think 
for a, applying to the bottom of chair legs to keep from marring or scratching your, your floors. It's a real hard felt. So I said, that I took one and attached it to one of the wheels and you load it up with rouge and now you've got a a buffing wheel instead of using the, the buffing wheels in a conventional method where you're where you're buffing on the edge in the felt wheels and different buffing wheels that they make for these motor tools this will work on, on a flat hold, holding the tube vertical and uh, this felt is, is pretty hard and it holds rouge real well and makes a good polishing good polishing tool give you something to think about uh, again what I what I use these these tools for the, the modified disc tools that I've put the velcro on I use them for again two things I use them for the final polishing and the final honing of the cutting tool coming in on the side I mean you the thing that's amazing about these silicon wheels you can polish something as high polish as you think you could ever put on a piece of metal, brass, steel, or whatever, and you follow it with this, and you can see it get polished more. It's uh, they're pretty, pretty good polishing tools. The, uh, the the other thing I use these tools for again is when I've got the sanding disc on them, and and you're ready to cut your wire inlay down to size to get it flush there's, there's different techniques that you can use uh, some guys will uh, will use a sharp chisel and, and cut away slowly uh, you can you can file it or scrape it the most effective and, and quickest way and, and the most uh, the safest way that I found for removing the, the surplus wire and getting it down to the wood is using one of these sanding discs uh, we'll demonstrate it after we, we do a wire inlay. But uh, so they're, they're dual purpose for sanding and polishing. And let's talk about the, the, the tools a little bit again. Most of, a lot of guys will make these stabbing tools and, and wire inlay tools out of X-Acto knife blades. And you, you, you shape them and size them just like I do the round ones. Uh, if they work quite effective, the reason I chose to do mine with round stock is I can step down in sizes just by choosing a different diameter of the wire and to me I feel like it's a little bit quicker. Here's two examples. Uh, this, I'm going to call this a medium tool. It's probably got a, a point width of, I don't know, a little over 16. This one's a little smaller and then we get down to this really detail in here. The, the tip width on this guy is probably you know, it's less than 50 thousandths, probably 40 thousandths. This is for getting in really tight scrolls, or really tight areas where you, where you want your wire to go in. <clears throat> we talked about the three different ways of I've used over the years in transferring the artwork to the wood. Uh, again, one of the one of the quickest is just just to draw it out with pencil, draw draw your artwork. This is this is what I did on on the scroll that we put on the scraper. We'll we'll get a close up of this, but if you draw it on the other method is with a piece of tracing paper pre-draw your, your artwork on the tracing paper and lay it face down because you you got to take in mind your, your reverse image but lay your tracing paper down on the wood and draw over what you drew and it will push and transfer enough of the uh, lead onto your wood to give you a reference to stab in. The method that I prefer over any of them is using the transparencies that are printed on the computer. I showed you a couple examples here, some of the artwork. 
I'm going to use a real small example just to keep the size down. But in order to get the artwork from the computer onto the wood, I, I came up with a process a few years back and it's been very effective for me. What I do is I print this, obviously you can't see it, but we'll, we'll zoom in after I do the transfer. This has some artwork on it that I want to put on the wood. So if you put it down and, and burnish it on there, it's not going to do you any good. Just like when you're trying to transfer artwork to metal, you have to put something, uh, magic marker, or there's different formulas of shellac and rubbing alcohol to pull the ink off of the transparency as you're burnishing the transparency. On wood, it's a little different. So what, what I came up with is, uh, this is going to take you back to your, your grade school days. I bet it's been a while since anybody in the viewing audience has seen or used a bottle of mucilage glue. This is the stuff we had in grade school. You could eat it and drink it and everything. It's, it's all organic. It won't hurt you. And uh, the neat thing about it, 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 won't, it won't affect your wood like if other transfer methods use. What I do is take this mucilage glue, stick the end of a, a, a small dowel, wooden tip, Q-tip, etc., and get you a, a liberal amount on there, and I rub it in, on top of the wood, kind of use just like rolling it on there, and get a, a you know a, a medium coat of the mucilage onto the wood and you can actually stop at this point after you smooth it out or you can go in with your finger and just kind of kind of rub it in make sure you're, you're spreading it out so you have an even coating of the mucilage glue on the wood now we'll wait just a oh, minute or so and let that glue dry it dries fairly fairly quick now, once the, the glue has, has dried on the wood, even though it's not extremely tacky, or it's not that tacky at all, really, but uh, you do have that layer of the mucilage on the wood. I normally wait until it's, when you touch it, it it's, not, uh, it's not sticky. The the best example I can give you is why I prefer the use of the transparency transfer method that we're getting ready to do over tracing paper or drawing is let's, let's assume that that's the line width exaggerated of your freehand drawn or tracing artwork that you've put onto the wood. Let's say that's the width of it. By comparison, a computer printed transparency is just a, it's an extremely fine line. So you can use this, but you have to use some interpolation and judgment of where that line's flowing because of the, the width of it. Let's call this the highway and that's the center line. When you got the center line or a computer transferred image and you've got an extremely pointed, extremely sharp stabbing tool, you've got, uh, feels like you've got a lot more control following that really thin line than this big wide line. Okay. It's still a little tacky, but let's see, let's see if we can we can put an image onto it. You got to make sure on these transparencies there's a smooth side and a, and a rough side or a satin side. The satin side or the rough side is where the ink has been deposited when you print it. So I, I put the transparency, the rough side down. It's it's adhered to the mucilage glue and now with a fine 
smooth ballpoint burnisher I'm going to try to go in and, and cover every little line every piece of the artwork that's on the transparency and when you remove it 